Hello everyone, this is Don Mike Mendoza, your host for Producing While Asian. Today's episode features Chil Kong, the Artistic Director of Adventure Theatre Company that's located in Glen Echo, Maryland, outside of Washington, D.C. Chil and I had our conversation actually in August of 2020. I ran into a few hiccups in terms of getting this series launched, so that's why you're now hearing this conversation a year later. So hopefully, I look forward to having an update with him in the future, but for now, enjoy this conversation about where he came from and what his hopes are for Adventure Theatre Company. Welcome to Producing While Asian. All right. Hi, Chill. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you. How are you? Good, good. Thank you so much for being here. Just to let our viewers know, you are my first guest ever on Production Insights. So this is so exciting. Yeah. And, you know, to hear, uh, or actually to just talk to you and, and pseudo work with you over the last few months in terms of things going on in the DMV community virtually, you know, it's been awesome. And I'm really glad that um, you had the time to chat with me today. So we're just going to get right into it and talk about producing and all things theater. So first, just tell me a little bit, or tell us rather, about your background, your experience, and how you got into the theater industry, and kind of, you know, where you put yourself on the scale of one to producer, I would say, just because producers wear so many different hats. So. Yeah, that's actually a very funny question. I started out in the producerial side as it evolved, but I really started out early on as a singer, as a jazz vocalist. Uh, did you know through high school and so singing was my tap into america my tap into english and i learned really the english language through song which oddly enough led me into musical theater because i love the storytelling as part aspect of, of musical theater and was headed into a career in advertising and in my first year as a professional i was working actually in richmond virginia at the time a friend of mine went on an audition for one of the summer parks. Um, I had been doing theme parks all you know, through college. One of the best, by the way, one of the best jobs ever as a performer, uh, especially if you're young, going through uh, the parks. So I, I went and I realized, uh, uh, oddly enough, I got the gig, the, uh, the person I went to with didn't. But it just made me think about where I want to be and what I want to do with my life. And one of the great awakenings of that Part of the process was um, I realized I needed more training. Like I, I can't, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I just was up here, you know, singing and dancing, but it's not like I had any form, formal training. So I had uh, auditioned for different conservatories and was, uh, was fortunate to get a full ride scholarship to the Boston Conservatory over in Boston. Uh, it's, it's now called uh, Boston Conservatory at Berkeley, uh, but it is in Boston. And so that's kind of led me down towards this path to theater. Uh, and actually, the, my first directorial class that I took that was really about what theater directing was, that opened my eyes to a whole new world and, and was my final aha moment. Because I like performing, but, and, it, and I enjoyed tapping into the, the process of performing, but, but I knew there was something missing. And so once I tapped into directing, it was like a whole other world of up. The second I embraced that, everything else started really happening very quickly. I, I uh, founded a theater company uh, out in Boston. I worked a lot. I was one of the few that was able to leave school and work their way, uh, you know, paid for all of their school loans through acting, which led me to then to San Diego to help run a giant project at the San Diego Repertory Theater. That led me to my own theater company up in Seattle. I was really young at the time, 28, made a lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes. And then uh, I was recruited down to Los Angeles to form what is now, what was then Lodestone Theater Ensemble. And that became kind of my heart. That company really uh, was the evolution of myself as a person, as an artist, as an artist director. And I owe that a lot to the, the core founding members that really made that happen. Uh, and we're still friends now, like we still check in once a week now. Um, it is. So that journey kind of led me into, because of LA, you're in Los Angeles. Uh, you do a lot of film and TV. So a lot of my board members were part of the film industry and they liked the way I told stories um, as a director. And so they really encouraged me and, and actually sponsored my education into film and TV. And, and then that 
then I got poached to run a film fund, be a creative director of a film fund. And then from there, 2016 happened. I didn't understand what my place in this world was. My son was four years old and, and I hadn't seen him in a, in a while because I was traveling so much. And I realized that I need to kind of reconfigure my life and go back to where my heart was, which was theater. Uh, I had still missed theater. I, I still been, while I was doing the film fund, was part of the, the Los Angeles Theater Alliance, did a lot of support work there. A friend of mine who uh, had a friend who needed help with a theater in New York City. So I came in as their GM to help them through some negotiations and, and, and get them off their feet so that they can hire somebody full time. And it, it was really, really lovely. It was nice to be back at theater. The yeah. problem was New York general managing is most, is kind of a different kind of producing. It's not the same as an artistic director. And so I was like art adjacent. I was theater adjacent. <laughs> So I realized that I, that I missed that part. And so I just started kind of looking around. And then at the same time, my parents weren't healthy. So I was coming down to DC a lot. And then I had known Michael Bobbitt for, I guess about eight years at the time when he had just started to become the artist director of adventure. And so he had posted on his thing that, hey, this is available. So, so I just said, oh, what's going on? I literally just kind of, yeah. kind of connected with him to say, hey, you know, people, artists are just simply don't leave. So what's going on? And so he was, no, no, no. He's leaving to go to a company in Boston. And it's a career move for him. And he was really excited. And then he asked me what I'd be interested in. And I, you know, I just, it, that wasn't in my world. I wasn't thinking about that. Right. But I said, sure. And then, you know, through lots of angst and interviews, a really thorough interview process, where this company, I could tell they were really committed to diversity because the, the two finalists were, were, were a color for the company for this. Then I really got to know Leon, who's the executive director, and, and felt like I was going to walk into a very stable organization. So I, I was super excited, and, and we said yes. <laughs> and here I am. Yeah. That's awesome. So that's how I had to be. Gotcha. So... And it's great because I, you know, being someone who's on the producing side in, in DC for a long time, there are very few of pe of us, of people like you and I who are Asian and on that side of the table. And, and it was really awesome to know that Adventure had chosen somebody like you to step into the role after Michael Bobbitt, who had already been such an amazing energy in the city yeah. for change and diversity, equity, and inclusion. So... So yeah, that's the thing. I really felt like I was just picking up the mantle of Michael Bobbitt. So it was, it was a great handoff. And you're right. But if you think about it, in the DMV, the, the D.C., Virginia, Maryland area, it's still less than 10 who are artists directors. Less right. than 10. Right. And Out of 100. <laughs> because that's insane, right? It's like, you know, and it reflects the industry, right? There's so very few uh, people who are in the API. They're concentrated in certain areas, I would say. But across the board, you know, it's it's not often that, that you have somebody behind the table, especially with shows that are about Asian stories. You know, the production team is usually a majority Caucasian or, you know, or not you know, us. So it, it's very cool to, to have you on board. So now you've been in your position for a year-ish, maybe a little over a year. And so yeah. how has your perspective kind of changed now after having a full year under your belt um, and been able to really kind of start making things your own? You know, talk to, talk to us about that experience. I don't know if my necessarily my perspective changed, but through COVID and a lot of different events, racist events even mm -hmm. uh, in the DMV, it showed me that we have a long way to go. You know, there, there was a racist incident even at an artistic director's leadership uh, meeting that happens weekly for the uh, theater, Washington. And so it was interesting when that can happen there in that space amongst all these leaders and allies yeah. and how they couldn't step up. What was shocking about that wasn't necessarily the event itself because, you know, that's happened to us all the time. Right. Yeah. We're right. the ones that have to suck it up at every meeting. We are the ones that have to play nice and... And ha ha ha, it's a joke. You know, we have to take that all the time. But in these room full of leaders who put out statements, 
right? That they are allies and advocates, you know, who went out there uh, and publicly put on their website saying that we're here for change. And so, you know, in that meeting, I called bullshit on everybody. Called it. Yeah. Because, you know, it's like all these people who say that they're for change, they, they were there. They were there for, the, for, for that moment. They were at the moment when they could have shown that they are an ally. They did not. So what that tells me, too, is that actually, unfortunately, you know, I'm, I'm an equal. You know, we're equals in this room. Right. That means what's, what happens to these people who are not equals? What happens in those rooms? So it was a stunning, stunning awakening because, you know, I had kind of assumed because I'm not part of the community. We all know each other. We, we, we're all for each other. It's not true. Racism exists. And a lot of these companies and a lot of these leaders have a long way to go. That was one. The other part is, though, is that despite that, the community is fairly tight. Mm -hmm. What I love is the freelance community has really bonded together. These are talented artists, and a lot of them, most of, you know, a large chunk of them people of color, who have really understood that they have power. These theaters now, these, you know, white allied theater companies, need these freelancers now. They need them. So, you know, more power to these folks who can now walk around and go, no. They, you know, the power of no exists now. Uh, and I hope they embrace it and I hope they take it. So I feel like there's a change coming. And what it's, what it's coming from is from the, 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 the folks who are less empowered to, to make, take that risk uh, are finally taking that risk and forcing the people who are empowered to make change, make change. And that's awesome. And, and it's also always like pinnacle times like we're experiencing right now in terms of racial justice, social economic justice, things like that. You're right. It comes out in these times because people realize that the limits that were placed upon them sometimes aren't real. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they're, they're made up by the people that have the power. You know, they, they, they make people perceive that they can't break these barriers that were created in, not in their favor. Well, what's, and this is something that is going to happen that I think people have to be aware of. It's, it's, it, because it's going to go against the fallacy of network, right? Mm -hmm. This idea that my friends, I trust my friends to do these things. My friends tend to look more like me, but, you know, they, these white leaders. Mm -hmm. And what happens is those friends get more opportunities to fail because they're friends. And what's going to happen now is these these, at these friends who, have, who could count on their friends to get them work are now going to have to go up against actual talented people and be, be equal to them or better. They will finally be to the scale. And this is where people are like, well, no, you, you're, just, you're just trying to you know, throw a person of color in there, but they don't deserve it. And I'm, and I'm no, no, no. Yeah. Let me be clear. The people who typically haven't deserved the position are, are, the, are the people who got their jobs because, they're, uh, because of the friendship network. And that's the thing that, that I think was interesting is the breakup of the friendship ne network that is starting to happen. Because if, if I work with black and indigenous people of color, but my friends are white, who am I going to hire? Who, right. exactly. who am I going to hire? I'm going to go to the comfort zone and hire my friends who are also happen to be artists. And, and because you are relying on a lot of money, your, your, your own name or whatever, lending to that. And so that risk analysis used to favor friendship, right? Mm -hmm. But because of the world we're in, it no longer favors the friendship. And the pushback that's going to happen are the, are the mediocre, white, straight males. That's what's going to happen. Let's be clear. And those that are the most vocal against this are the ones because they know that they're not good enough to compete against these black and indigenous people of color artists are going to fight against it. And that's when you know. When the, the ones that are the loudest are probably the ones that understand that they're not good enough to be in the same room. Remember that. It's interesting. All of y'all out there, remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's interesting because that, that concept kind of bleeds over into other industries as well, right? Where, you know, politics, for example, the one politician who is the most against something is usually somebody who's A, not that great, and B, that thing that they're trying to go against, you know, or something, or, or is somebody that wants something so badly, so they kind of end up in the opposite universe and fight against it because if they can't have it, then no one can have it. You know, it's... Yeah. 
So it's yeah, I, I think one of the one of the most tragic ones of those is uh, are these closeted gay conservatives who fight against their own life, and then you know thirty years later come out and want acceptance and. Right. Ah. It's too late. It, 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 it literally just happened with someone like three months ago. I think it was. You know, I'm in DC, the former former congressman. But anyway, but that that's very prevalent in theater. It's people that create limits, especially producers, create limits in the industry because they have some kind of chip on their shoulder about it, or and they're not talking about it. So the way they act out is they they do. <laughs> Well, so. well, also, let's be clear, the majority of the producers that are not part of the big, like, 20 theater companies, right? Mm -hmm. These smaller theater companies, a lot of them, they, because they feel like they have some kind of, you know, uh, privilege or gumption or whatever you call it, decided they wanted to create their own theater company. And sometimes, a lot of it is because they couldn't get work anywhere else, right? Right, right. So, uh, so you have to remember that. And so when a lot of these folks push back, it's it, you you start to once you start questioning their uh, the reasons why they push back it starts becoming clearer and clearer that how you battle them because it's because at that point it's not about like equality at that point it's about their inability to believe in their own craft mm -hmm. right because at the end of the day if all these people say well we want the best no, you don't. What you're picking is the best that's your friends. Right. That's the difference. Right. And it's interesting because a lot of people don't, that's so subconscious and so built in to all of us and, and on any, on either side of the table that, it, you know, I would say actors do it between each other too. Like who, who do they tell about auditions? You know, because actors can be very competitive. You know, I, I I hate to say that, but I've done it. You know, I used to be an actor where I'm like, oh, I can tell this person about this audition, but not that person. Because it's like, you know, either it's a non-compete or it's like, you know, somebody who I, you know, selfishly know might not get it. You know, things like that. So... Want to hear more about your favorite TV shows and movies that are on countless streaming services? Then listen to Up Next with your new favorite hosts, me, Kristen Aviles. And me, Christina Walter. Every other week, we'll highlight one genre, but two movies or TV shows, one old and one new. We'll let you know what's hot and what's not from your favorite or least favorite streaming services. And be sure to stay tuned to the end of each episode where we shout out an artist whose name you should know for their talent in the industry. So follow us to stay up to date with your favorite hosts from Up Next, a part of the Press Play Podcast Network. But in producing, it's really interesting because you, you, you see... I mean, it's hard to explain, like, and, and let me know if you can have a better, or if you have a de better definition of it. I feel like when producers are competing with each other, it's, it's a game of like, in a weird way, who's more popular? Like, who do you know? Who, like, how many more people do you know at what level? And, you know, how much, if you have, a, if you have your own production company, like, how much reputation can you get for your own company based on who you're collaborating with and so I, it's such for sure. me I haven't been able to define that feeling but I, I see it that amorphous feeling I see it happening a lot but I don't know what that's called so I don't know if you can define that better for me from your travels and experiences in, in this field. I, I used to call that the hat rack effect hmm. but it comes from younger producers and producers who are looking to make their mark they tend to hold a hat rack around them and take people's hats, right? So that they can show people all these hats that I'm, that I'm working with. And, and sure, I've done that. I, it, it helps with recognition. It helps with popularity. It helps with getting things greenlit for film and TV. And that's all true. But as you get older and more experienced, you realize that you need to build a community no matter what so that the call that you make isn't a, oh, I haven't talked to you, who, what? You want what? You know what I mean? Like, it can't be a surprise. And that's why it's like, uh, that, that's why you have to be so careful about how and who you build relationships with and what you do. 
if, if your first ask is inequitable, right, as a producer, then there's something wrong with the way you're doing things. Especially if it feels inequitable. You know, like, the worst is do me favors for free. This is also why I've, I've consciously made a big thing about no matter what, people get paid to do something with me. It doesn't matter what it is. They're going to get paid if they're going to work. And mostly I can't, I can't afford, like, what I want to afford. You know, people's value. Yeah. So I tell them that. I said, I am usually pretty straight up about that. And, and say, I value you more than what I can pay you, uh, but this is what I can pay you. Um, I hope that there's a chance for me later on that I can pay you more, but this is a building block. But that's why it's important that I am straight up and, and pretty upfront about that, all those. I get what you mean by popularity contests, especially if you are a new producer in here or a new institution, right? Like. I have the benefit of having experience, but also attached to a, you know, 71 year old institution. So I have a lot of benefits uh, because of that. And we're a large institution on top of that. So when I reach out, it, it's, it sadly does mean something, but honestly it shouldn't. I mean, I haven't, if I haven't made a relationship with you, then it's on me, not on the freelancers. Or, uh, mm -hmm. And honestly, I'm really, I'm, at the end of the day, I'm really nobody until I prove to you that I, that I have more value to you, right? Right. Um, it goes back to the friends network of, you know, unless I already know who you are, you know, it's kind of, yeah. you have to start with, not start with zero. With also making sure, it's also making sure that, I, that I'm setting expectations of respect. Mm -hmm. Because, I, cause look, I don't expect people to return my phone calls. I mean, who the heck am I? I, I I'm nobody here. What I hope is that I am out there enough so that people see that I'm trying and in my efforts to try to do better and, 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 and try to make sure that people feel welcome and respected in, in, in our space, that because of that, it allows me to have a larger kind of reach, right? Mm -hmm. but, but that's earned. It is not deserved. It is not, you know, you've got to earn it. You've got to earn it every day. So, you know, I hope that I'm doing that every day. Yeah. And it's interesting when you when you notice people who kind of, they, they started there, they started with the, the building reputation and building that trust with the community. And then all of a sudden, well, not all of a sudden, but in some people you see the switch from building that community to feeling they deserve things. And it doesn't happen often, but there, there are a handful of people that I've seen over my time where I'm like, oh, they changed, you know, they became, entitled is the is the word and and i i believe you and i've talked about this before in our bigger group meetings but in this industry in this field nobody is entitled to anything it's it's all earned relationships and it's all you know trust building because it, with every new project it's always a new journey it's never you know you don't base the last project of, or the new project off of the last project unless you're specifically talking about like were you a terrible person last time? You know, it, it's, it's all its own, its own thing. I, I think what's important about this though, is that entitlement giving to, given to you mm -hmm. is very different than entitlement that you take, that yep. you right. uh, assume. And I hope that eventually I build a community that constantly approves of what I'm doing and shows us that, shows me that, by accepting roles and doing these things and developing pieces with me and, and because knowing that I'm trying to build something with them, that it's a long-term relationship. And so uh, that I hope I do get, but you know, I, I think in many ways, it, everything is relational, right? Everything is, is, it's no different than you and a partner mm -hmm. and you and a community member who is your partner, right? Uh, how you define that partnership, it's still a partnership. And, the worst thing, the thing, the thing that can destroy any partnership is disdain. The the second you start, you start feeling like you're the more important part of that relationship, disdain starts to creep its head, and, and that's honestly when it's my time to go. Right? Mm -hmm. If that happens, then that means I am too big for my britches and don't feel like I deserve, I, or or that I should go to a bigger pot, whatever. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like then I should go, because. Because I'm gonna, I'm from that moment on. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna create a disturbance and be a disservice to my community. Because right. I've lost some kind of respect for this for this community, and that's a terrible place to be. Like I hope, I hope I never feel that way. But I am not perfect. Right? Like I will make mistakes.
So uh, I just hope that I've built enough of a community that when I do start doing that, they just somebody just kicks me in the shin. You know what I mean? I just go, bam, <laughs> stop it. Right? Right. Uh, right. So. I mean, and, you know, it's, we all have that, hopefully at least one, but, you know, some people are lucky to have several, but people that will do that, that say, hey, are you really still happy doing this? Like, is that something that, and I feel like as a producer, I, I run into that too, where kind of like with different projects or different paths of, of what we're producing and what we're putting together, you know, I do have the same thoughts sometimes where I'm like, in regard to a specific, and, and franchise is the wrong word, but like a program that we're doing, you know, sometimes it's kind of like, do, like I'm excited, but then there are times where you're like, oh, well, am I doing this because I'm still excited about this line of programming or is am I doing it just to go through the motions of doing that line of programming? You know, so we used to have, we used to have some, a program that we started eh, like three years, well, it was a while ago, but it was a show called the Asians are awesome show. And we were trying to highlight API talent in the DMV, but for some reason it wasn't catching fire. Like it wasn't, you know, it, unlike Latido, the cabaret, which, it almost immediately became something. And, and we, we haven't really had the time to sit down and look back on it just because we've been moving forward so much. But that was something that I always reflect on. It's like, we eventually stopped after three of them because we, we learned that in that time, you know, we learned that the talent was excited about it, but the community wasn't that excited about it. You know, they, we didn't have a lot of people being like, oh, I totally want to go there. And, and I think our purpose in starting it was to, sh to show the community that if you're looking for API actors or performers, here's one resource you could go to just to see them perform. Like it's not even a casting call. It's you're casually going to see them perform, but you know, it didn't catch, but you know, there are also other factors like in terms of where it fell in our season, where it fell with other stuff. But you know, in that sense, like I, I really wanted it to work, but it just didn't. So we stopped. And so not that I resented it, but I would say it was kind of that lesson of, you love letting go of like realizing like, okay, well, time to move on before I made myself hate it, you know? And, and I know that that's a hard limit sometimes with things, um, which is really, yeah, I mean, that's one of the weirdest things about producing is knowing when to stop or knowing when to say no. Right. It's like right. that in itself is, is a skill and you'll always get it wrong. Right. right. You'll, you'll always stop too soon or you'll start too late or, you know, but, uh, the, the most important part of that is that you've allowed yourself the gift of failure. Right? It's funny because um, I... Um, well, talk to, me about, I, talk to me about that, like in your, in your experience, like something that's related to that. Yeah, I mean, I've, the, the, there are times when I really felt like I failed. I failed as either a person or as a producer or as a director. The hard part in that is that... You know, Mike's goal has always been, like, I got to tell the story and, it, and it's, and I've taken it on because it's an important story to tell, right? Well, no matter what it is, and it, it's important in this time. And if I fail to tell that story, really, really, it's, it impacts me in ways that are visceral and spiritual, right? And this yeah. is all true for all artists. Mm -hmm. But the difference is when you fail a group of people and not a story, right? It's very different. And so... You know, uh, one of my biggest failures were probably was probably up in Seattle when I just could not get the community behind me for some reason. I mean, I, there were reasons. Like I was incredibly arrogant. Yeah. I was 28, sure. uh, running a, a large theater company, and felt like I had all the answers, and did a couple of really stupid things, which is like I changed just haphazardly changed the logo, uh, not even thinking about it. And then found a little later that it was like this designer who was a homegrown hero who has become this, you know, this artist. I just stomped on, you know, <sighs> it was, you know what I mean? Like, right. it's, and that was just one piece. So like I'd done all these little mistakes just out of pure arrogance. Mm -hmm. And, and it wasn't, you know, and that was a difficult, like I was, I was riding high on the hog, right? Cause I was so young you know, right. and I was running a large scale company. And I needed to be knocked down a peg. And the great thing was, even though I had failed the Seattle community, I had a group of other artists who still looked out for me and said, hey, why don't you, why don't you come down to LA? You know, I could have tried to stay to fix it. And I just, 
I wasn't, I didn't have the skill sets. Sure. Right? I just didn't. Mm -hmm. And I think I had probably burned enough bridges up there. So I was just like, you know, I think this is enough. I should just go. Yeah. And it was a good move because I was, uh, I was allowed like two years just to recover emotionally and from all, and from all that. And, and that group of people who, who still maintained their faith in my skills, gave me a lot of hope. And now I don't look at failure the same way, right? If, cause, cause that person, and think about this, cause this happens a lot to leaders of color. You, it's the one shot deal. Like you get one shot at it and then you're known as that person who destroyed whatever. Right, yeah. So I was really thankful that even though I left the company in Seattle, um, actually fairly financially healthy, like I, I had burned enough bridges because of my stupidity and arrogance right. that I needed to leave. And what was great is that I was embraced by a community down in LA and it and allowed me to try to fix the, my, my errors. And it took me a while. Like they're really great about, about correcting me and, 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 and showing me that I can lead different ways because they believed in me. And that's what we need. We need spaces of failure, especially because, because think about this. In this friendship network of white people and their friends, they're allowed to fail all the time. You know, we're it, they're white directors and spectacular too. Like not just like a, oh, I mistyped this word. Like spectacular failures and and they're fine. You know? And they're called back again because they're friends. And and that's the thing is that we need to 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 allow people the room for failure, especially Black Indigenous people of color. Mm -hmm. because the key to this of course is that we build them a support network so that they learn from it and they're continually growing uh, because you know only through that can we get better but because then you'll you'll have these artists and artistic leaders and producers who will take a risk on something because they know that they won't be they won't be destroyed by it right that they can you know, if you're putting that many eggs in one basket, then people become tentative. Then you start doing these like less risky shows and mm -hmm. you don't take the same kind of risk that you want to do. And I think it's vital to create an environment where people feel like they can take a risk. A lot of times when I'm in rehearsal and I'm not involved as a director, I try not to do too much. I literally just kind of poke in and say things. And, but, you know, I'm very aware of what's happening in the room usually. Yeah. But, but, you know, they need to feel like they're trusted so I typically just kind of walk out of the room and say, hey, it looks great. <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. it's that. It's, it's, it's making sure that people feel like there's a space there, that it's theirs. That it's, it's their space, not mine. And so I try to work hard every day to do that. It isn't easy because, you know, yeah. I'm worried about the numbers every day. Mm -hmm. right? I'm worried about the, the, you know, I have to look at the overall health of the organization. And there are mm -hmm. mistakes that I might make. I have to make sure that I put buffers in for those mistakes. But I also have a fairly smart and really supportive community that are excited about the kind of risks that I'm going to take and, uh, you know, and acknowledge that we're going to take the risks and we're, you know, still willing to jump on board. So. so the next question is kind of twofold and relates to what we just were talking about. So speaking of productions and, and working with other people and, and kind of, creating that community or that space of, of being able to fail. Talk to me about, first talk to me a little bit about how you're building, how you build your production teams, especially with Adventure Theaters Initiative that goes be before this current situation in this country and in the theater community, you know, the We See You movement. Like, talk to me about that, how, how you yeah. form your team you know, following those kind of values that are built into Adventure. And then where do you see the 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 change coming like and and if you could call out a specific and you might not have an answer to this part but if you could call out a specific i don't want to say job but line of work in theater that's severely lacking in the diversity department and there are a lot you know when, when you're forming your team where do you find your biggest challenges in terms of finding the specific professional you want so i know that was a lot but so I started with the first one in terms of like building your team well, in, in this time. One of the big reasons, and there was like a, like a list of five things that I wanted. And uh, oddly enough, Adventure hit all five. One of them is that it had an EDI 
equity, diversity, and inclusion in place. Mm-hmm. And this is, again, this is the, the, the work that Michael Baba did, right? So they've been working on this for three years. Right? Mm-hmm. So the board was already, when I arrived, it was already uh, what, 40% um, Black Indigenous people come, which is more than any board that I, that I think I've seen in the DMV. Um, so if, if it's not the, one of the best, if it's not the best, it's one of the best in, in, uh, as, as board diversity. The staff, even though it's a small staff, it's still, and it's still less than half, but it's like in the, in, uh, in the 40% range too. So, you know, I, I was surprised by the, the amount of diversity in the organization itself. Mm-hmm. Now, with that caveat, <laughs> is that I am the only person of color in leadership, right? Mm-hmm. So, yes, so that's the kind of, that's the world that I'm living in. Now, we've had this, I guess, a public statement about more than half of our, you know, of, of our people on stage and the people behind the stage will be of Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And since I have arrived, we've been like 80%. So, you know, just pure numbers wise, like sure. we've, we've been very successful at getting the people we need. Now, the philosophy, and by the way, also when we're digital, it's like 90%. So, yeah. right. so you know, it's been, uh, and the thing is, it isn't that we're trying to hit this number. What it is, is I just wanted to reflect the community and reflect the stories that we're trying to tell. So, you know, so seriously, if, it, if, there's, a, if, if there's more like, like here's an example. I hired a creative team who, there were white women, but the story itself centered around girls' issues and the way, the stereotype about math with girls, right? Mm-hmm. And this was an amazing team that just had that, pitched me at the right time and 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 i loved the you know they taken my idea and they they came back with something really inventive and smart and so they were brought on board what was great about them is that they're also like as we talked they were also committed to diversity Hmm. and so so that was an easy yes because i knew that i didn't have to fight them on characters and things and directors of color or or you know and I was fortunate enough in finding an amazing dramaturg. She is our literary associate, Davinia. She is multi-ethnic plus non-binary. So it is an interesting, like we have already within our team, a fairly diverse voice that is reflecting and sounding and, and creating our own community, right? Like right. our friendship base. Mm-hmm. And so it is, it is, it is, allowing us to tap into a different way in this what is very specifically gender specific story with different eyes and different colors of the room, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Now, that same thing, that same philosophy, it just has to resonate every day. Like we have to breathe this. That's the, that's the thing is that if we're gonna reflect our community, then we need to make sure that we reflect the stories that this community needs and wants to tell. And that, and you know, it still comes from my perspective, right? It's still, it still has, because I'm the quote unquote artist director, it's still kind of funneled through me. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm trying to change. Because I may not think something looks good, right? But uh, somebody else that says, no, I know this type of story and I know what they're doing. And so I have to trust my community to say, this is a great story. You should do it and go, okay, let's do it, mm-hmm. right? That's what I'm trying to build in this EDI kind of mesh. And making sure that I am I that I don't become a veto power. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, because because yeah. the veto feels like well, the arbitrator said no, and what it needs to feel like is well, the 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 artistic team wants to find out what works for you. That's different way mindset. Uh, again, that includes a way to look at who represents that story, mm-hmm. and it is vital that we get the right people who. Are, who are representing the story, right? Now, it some of, sometimes it's not clear, right? And so what happens to a lot of those is that the, 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 the default storytelling then becomes white. Mm-hmm. And at that point is when what we've consciously decided is that if it's not clear, then we're going to default something else. Right. That we're going to default the story to something else. 
And I think that's what shifted the way who is representing the stories, right? Mm -hmm. That's the biggest shift. Now, what do I think is the, is the problem? And I mean, I wouldn't say, you know, not necessarily a problem, but like the biggest challenge, you know, in terms of, of yeah. heading toward that goal and that change, you know? Look, it, and that could I be am fortunate. Person. It could be across the board, you know, either one. No, I, I will say, because this is what I'm looking, the way I, I look at that question is more about uh, through adventure <laughs> and, and what are the, the, the funnels of talent, right? Because um, I, was, I was asked when I first got here that I should talk to some of these bigger theater companies just to talk to them and build relations and stuff like that. And, and after the first three or four meetings, I was like, there's nothing, you know, I, li I like these people, but they do nothing for adventure. There's nothing, you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. it, is, it is an unbalanced relationship anyway. And so I was just like, I don't need to talk to them. Why do I need to talk to them? What I need to do is support the funnel. I need to go out there and talk to these small theater companies and figure out who they like. How do I support them as they develop in their small theater companies so that they can come to us in a different way? And so uh, it, it is more about approaching this as, a, as uh, like, if I'm going to be the big brother, I need to start acting like a really good big brother. Right? Yeah. I need to help my younger siblings and make sure that they grow with me. Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, with that in mind, you know, there isn't any specific area that, that has the most challenge. It is, it is mostly, this is what I'm finding, that I guess the biggest challenge is the, the, the decision maker's assumptions about who's available. Yes. That's what I think is the challenge. Yes. Absolutely. Because anybody who says to me they can't find this person, I'm calling bullshit every time. Every time. And, and and I and I'm gonna tell you right now, if any artist director has the guts to say that to my face, I will have a rap battle with them that <laughs> second to talk about yeah. a list of whoever that they haven't even talked to yet. I will. Right. And I've only been here for a year. So and I mean everything from designers to sound design, light, blah, you know, prep, props, but puppetry, like they they exist. And, and it is that they're not looking hard enough, is that their perception of what they expect or want is very different than what they're presenting. And some of these people aren't gonna to come to them because they don't trust you. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was just gonna say that it goes both ways. Like, you know, there are some yeah. theater companies, not like you said, not that they're not looking hard enough, but they're not recognizing what's around. And then the people in the community because I, you know, the DMV has a very, very strong community theater community. Like there's a lot of people in that community and a lot of crossover too. A lot of people who do community theater, but also work professionally. And they don't, you, they don't come forward because they either feel what you just said they can't trust, or they feel that the friends network that we're talking about is going to be who's hired. It's not going to be, they're not going to try on someone. new, And so that's, that's, you were inside my head when you're talking about that. I was like, yep, that's... Well, yeah, but you know, that's the thing, right? It's, that, that's the thing, the, right? These, the these people, yeah, the, these, these, these folks who are supposed to be leaders in our community, right? If two designers, like, let's say for one show, if two designers who are of color have said no to you, mm -hmm. the first thing I would say is, what am I doing wrong that why they're saying no? Right. That'd be my first question. Not, hey, well, why are they so busy? Why are they so, no. Mm -hmm. If more than one designer who is of color, who, you know, just like, just doesn't want to work with you, there's something wrong that you're doing. Or right. something wrong that, you know, you're, that something within your chain of commander network is doing. There's something wrong in your house. Mm -hmm. Fix your house, right? right. The, the second part to this is, if you do like it, it is not a get, it's not a take take relationship. If you do not do anything for the other community, then don't expect them to give anything to you. Don't, you yeah. know, this, this is why it's like my first year when I, like I just made sure that I was trying to like one of the biggest things people, my first bunch of meetings, they, they all, all of them said, Oh, so how do I get to then I go, I said, no, 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 you don't have to do that. I'll come to you. So I just made sure that, that, that it, 
that I was that I was at least making an effort to come to their place to mm -hmm. at least try to hear them from in their safe space. Right. And 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 then figure out how I can help their organization. Right. Like what can I do? What what is it that I can how can I just give something so that it feels like I'm I'm trying to connect in some way. I have been always successful, but but uh, but you know it's like that time. That's the thing. People think, well, that's all you're, you're wasting all the time. I said, no, 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 I'm not. I'm building relationships. This, the, the value that I'm that I that I'm really getting is when I'm connecting to somebody, doing something that like I do anyway, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like play reading or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, or helping analyze scripts and stuff. I do it anyway. So why not do that for someone else and help the company? But also just take the time. You know, it's like you know, it, it, yeah. If I can't commit my time to them, then why the hell should they commit their time to me? I mean, honestly. Right. Yeah, you're right. It's that simple give and take. You know, nobody, people can be busy, but I don't think anybody is too busy to help someone else. You know, at the, yeah, very, it just, it, you know, at the very least, refer them to someone. You know, it's, it's not yeah. hard. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Are you I mean, it makes me laugh. It makes me laugh when I have like, there are a few artist directors who, who like have an assistant and, you know, and I need one too. We're all busy, right? But, yeah. but they don't even, but they don't, but, you know, their, 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 their assistance is what's numbers on their card, right? Not their own personal right. card. And I just like, I mean, I mean, you're, you're, you're not just a path. I mean, let's, come on. Right. Yeah. I, <laughs> I mean, that's I mean, one of the things that drew me like to. Like if I don't recognize a, if I don't recognize your number, I don't pick it up. Like, what else do you, how else, I mean, what are you doing? I, I don't understand that. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I, you know, as much as I, uh, many people have said to me, why do you have your cell phone number on, you know, your business card? And like, because I want people to contact me. <laughs> like, you know, I want to be in touch and be available, you know, and if I'm not available, then I'll get back to them or, you know, whatever. But this is Mike Voorhees, co-host of A Swing and a Tribe MLB podcast. If you love Cleveland Indians baseball, then this is the pod for you. We've got you covered each week as we talk about all the games, breaking news, trades, the roster, all things Tribe. You're going to love it. Go Tribe. Hello, Brooks here with the Books with Brooks monthly book club podcast. We read one book a month and then we talk about it. Books like Stephen King's The Shining or Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens. If you're on the hunt for book recommendations and enjoy sparkling conversation, come read along with us and then listen in. So the reason why I'm having these conversations, and again, thank you so much for being part of it, is that I never knew that I wanted to be a producer, right? I, I went to theater school and I was like, I'm going to be the next Jose Lana. It's going to be awesome. And who's our good friend, but it's like, I, I wanted that, like I wanted to be a Broadway star. And, and then I learned the realities of being a PI in theater and the limits that we have in terms of working, you know, you either, and, and I'm generalizing because this is, this is just my experience, but like I was seeing that I either had to be in one of the big five, which was like Miss Saigon, The King and I, you know, Flower <laughs> Drum Song, um, South Pacific, Pacific Overtures. That was like, or go into opera, but like that's what I was seeing. And so I didn't. And I, you know, I thank, thank the universe every day for my co-founder, Reggie Kabiko, who came in and he's 20 years older than me and went through the same experience 20 years prior and was like, you need to create your own opportunities. And so that's how I, long story short, ended up becoming more a producer than a performer. And I, I started this production insights because there is no, and the world out there that's watching can correct me if I'm wrong, but there's, there is no university for producing. Like the closest I got to it was the commercial theater Institute in New York. And I did the production in intensive over a weekend. They have a 14 week option, but I'm a proud alumni of that program. But you know, you don't go to theater school to major in producing, you know, there's no, there, to my knowledge, there's, there's no theater school that provides that track. You can go into production like stage managing or things like that, but no one's there to teach you producing unless you really touch on arts management, which, you know, that, that, touches producing, but producing is such an amorphous word and field anyway, you know, so this is my attempt at providing that resource for people 
who are thinking about producing, don't know what it means, want to see people like them if they're like me, who are like, well, when I think about producing, I just think of powerful white men. <laughs> okay, you know, so that's really, you know, the, the ignorant opinion that I had 10 years ago. And so that's why this exists. So in that spirit, these chats always end up in a, what piece of advice would you give young people? But, uh, you know, what piece of advice have you received that didn't quite pan out the way it should have, but in like, given that experience, how would you modify that piece of advice so that it works better? This is hard because uh, <laughs> it, hard one, one, it, it, it's, it's two parts to this, right? Sure. The first part is uh, how, there are multiple ways you can define producing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's why a lot of artistic directors are called producing artistic directors. And even producers aren't really called producers in the same way, like in on Broadway. Right. right. So it, it, do, it does depend on what you mean by that. Now, mm -hmm. For me, so in the sense of theater, live theater, you know, that that's, let's keep it in that bubble, I would say, since that's what my sure, majority of what we're talking That's about. still what we're talking about though. Yeah, right. Producing live theater, uh, there, there, there's the, there are the people who do the, the physical production, which is putting a show together, getting it on a date, doing the public, you know, the, the things that make the show go, right? And then there's things that make the show happen. Two different things. Right. So it depends on what you mean by that. The things that make the, the thing, the producing that makes the thing go is part of arts administration. It's part of stage management. It's part of production management. Mm -hmm. It's part of that. But the thing that, get, that, that starts it, that inspires it, that's a whole other thing. That's the money part. That's, mm -hmm. you know, so it depends. The second part to that is, is I had to learn all this by trial and error. Like, yeah. however, I did come from a business background. Like my undergraduate, I got a marketing psychology degree. Like I got a business degree. And so I knew how to functionally run an organization, right? Or at least I was taught the skill sets. Yeah. Right, right. That's what, you know, and I was given all those, like how to run like IBM or how to run my like, Google. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've seen all those, mm -hmm. but the best that I, the, the thing that I learned the, the, the best was actually through my discussions, oddly enough, about philosophy and about Sun Tzu, Lao Tzu, right? Okay. Uh, and Lao Tzu, there's, there's, it's, it's kind of the Bruce Lee way of thinking for theater, <laughs> which is when he says, be like water. And in many ways, the, the best definition of a really good producer is, is the, are the spokes of the wheel, right? Mm -hmm. the, the wheel, the people on the outside of the wheel, they don't know that there are things holding the wheel together. Right. Right? But the wheel goes, and it keeps, and, it, and if you make it really strong, uh, and it has all the support, and has the right balancing and calibration, that wheel can spin forever, and spin super fast, and, and be incredibly beautiful and creative. But without the spokes, but you know, without the spokes, it can't run. And but the best leaders are the ones where the people, the wheels, come at the end and go, look what we did, mm -hmm. and not turn around and go, look what the spokes did for us. Right, and I think that's when that's when produce, when great producers and great producing happens, when the hands-on creative people and the, and the talent on the front lines are the ones who are taking all the credit, and may not necessarily you know know that you're the you're responsible for a lot of it, but because of of the community that you built, because of the stabilization that you um, that you've given it, the foundation of support. They were, this magic was allowed to happen. Mm -hmm. So I guess the best guidance to that was that maybe that didn't work out, but I would augment, is that when I first started, somebody always told me, make sure people know that I knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Like I, I was told that, you know, the whole like, you know, you can't wave the flag if they don't think that you could hold the, the flag, right? And I was like, Anybody can hold a flag. Cares about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, what, yeah. So, honestly, what I learned is, is, isn't that, is that, that I'm better served when I actually don't know what I'm doing and mm -hmm. tell people. And then, but, but reach out and say, let's figure this out together. Mm -hmm. right? So, I guess if, there, if there's that, 
Um, but honestly, I can't even remember who told me that. <laughs> I mean, that's, I, it doesn't matter, but I, I think that's, that's it's all. It's you know, it doesn't matter who it was. But, you know, I, I agree. I would say my, my most memorable producing experiences have been when we all worked together and it wasn't me dictating to people what should happen, you know, because there is that, you know, where somebody hires a producer because they're like, what do I do? But, you know, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, I would say some of the best experience I've had is when everybody has a piece of the pie and we're all working toward that same, same production goal together, yeah. um, which is awesome. It's, yeah. It's funny. I started out when I first started out, and this is probably the best analogy, is that I started out like a, like what, like I felt building a theater company was like building a boat, right? Mm -hmm. But I would jump out and go, let's build this boat. Come on, everybody. And I had to design the blueprint of the boat and I would, and I would, you know, point fingers and get everybody done to, you know, that's how organizations were. I, I felt like a function that, it, that I'm the one that was in charge and I got it to go. As I grew older, I realized, um, no, I was like, no, 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 let's build a community and we're getting a team and we're all, and these specialists will come out and they figure out the different parts of the boat, but I'm still in charge and I'm still the captain working over there. Right. Right. I got older and I'm like, no, that's not what it is. It's like, let's just get a group of people and we, and we work together to build this boat and we come up with ideas of how to make it through the process. And then we get in there and then we go out to the sea. Right. I was like, no, <laughs> there's no boat. That's when I when I started making actual evolutions. Like, there's no boat. Yeah. There's no boat. There's just a destination. We can build whatever we want. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a boat. But let's figure. And you know, that's where we're gonna go. And finally, my final. I think. I think what I feel like I've, I've finally started to evolve even now is that there isn't even a destination. Now it's like, yeah. Where do we want to go? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's figure this out together, right? Right. That, that's the interesting. And parts like you, you know, um, there, it's a lot about the ego in the beginning. Then it's about like the ego of the group, and then it's about the ego of the organization, and it's about the ego of the whole thing. And you realize there's no ego at all. That's when you actually make a real deal. So that's yeah. awesome. Today was awesome. I, I'm so glad to to learn from you today. I learned a lot that I, I didn't already know, and so which is the point, right, of having these conversations. So. I really appreciate you being here and hopefully we'll chat again later at a different date when yeah. other things come up and you know our door my door is always open so let's, let's definitely keep in touch on other things so thank yeah, you yeah I can't wait to be able to see you in person and get I to know. see you in the Monte and, uh, see you all your all the bright shiny pink faces that I'm there singing uh, in one day <laughs> one day <laughs> all right so well, I'll see you later have a good day yeah Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Producing While Asian podcast. Our theme song was created by Luckstock. We are produced by Press Play Podcast, and the show is edited by Michael Santos Sandoval. If you have a moment, please leave a review and a rating, and be sure to send us any topic ideas you have to producingwhileasian at gmail.com. To follow us, stay updated, and read our blog, visit www.producingwhileasian.com. We hope you join us again soon. 